What is this talk about? What is this presentation about? Well, I do like political discourse. So obviously it's political discourse. And in political discourse, there are different issues such as the notion of hegemonic discourse, how control is, or how power is sometimes enforced and how we um, does this abuse in public discourse, especially also sometimes in, in let's say in a different and more domestic sphere, but especially in the public sphere, and um, how some of those are construed and how some of those are, this type of hegemonic discourse is like um, counteracted. And uh, that's something um, um, we do analyze in political discourse. Um, Sorry, uh, can I interrupt you? Sure. You, say they, you can only see you, but they cannot see the presentation, which is oh. Are you sharing the presentation? That's about just a second. You tell me, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see it now? Uh, All right, let me see. Just a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah, you see? Yeah, can yeah. you see it now? Yeah, yeah. That's lovely. That's lovely. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, by the way, um, um, <laughs> we could have, uh, you could have told me that you could have just see, you could just see my face. So it's much better now. Right, so I said that uh, the this presentation then is about political discourse with these issues. So how um, um, we sometimes um, um, in this type of discourse we show different versions of reality, and this is something we study through critical discourse analysis, especially through the analysis of how this version of reality is um, linguistically, discursively produced, articulated through wording. Um, in this type of analysis, we needed uh, real data, and that's where corpus linguistics is really a must, right? So this is what basically the talk was about. And uh, uh, I was thinking about it. Let me see if this works. Hopefully it does or not yeah yeah so we do study performativity right so how we perform our, our persona in discourse uh, we also study how we represent others the universe surrounding us and the social actors involved in, in those in that universe especially in the public domain um we also do analyze um, are interested in how knowledge is institutionalized. This is really important. And how sometimes these are these practices are also institutionalized. And what is the institutionalized become uh, reality and the, the only truth uh, that we must be interested in. And uh, if we analyze this from a critical discourse analysis, especially when we look at this different versions of reality through the wording of this reality, we are tracking ideology. So this is more or less what this talk should be about. Finally, if we um, rely on corpus linguistics, which is something that uh, in your previous lecture and most of you are aware of already, we are trying to avoid something. This cherry picking that sometimes critical discourse analysts have been um, criticize for it, right? Because um, sometimes we choose some particular text, we choose some particular uh, topics, and what we should, what we invited to do is just to let text talk to us. And definitely this is something we can do by analyzing real data. Or uh, some corporate linguists say that we are looking at naturally occurring conversation, which is, well, Sometimes, sometimes not conversation, sometimes just that real data, real text. And um, 
this will allow us for first of all about research bias uh, obviously there won't be any uh, i think um, no coloring from our side and we'll see lots of things that we did not expect before right this presentation uh, combines two aspects two ideas i really like a lot on the one hand politics as a scholar i'm interested in politics and uh, and in politicians um, presentation of these versions of reality but as a citizen of the world i'm also interested in politics myself and uh, that's why I thought that this proposal could be like a combination of who I am, and what I'm doing, and I've done already. And I believe in the power of corporate linguistics, so that's why I thought it was well, a very nice proposal uh, to try to work on this perfect, imperfect presentation. Um, actually, um, some years ago, I started looking at different political speeches. Uh, I wanted to see individuals such as, well, you see there are some of them, you know them all. And I started looking at the type of language they use in their political speeches. Um, perhaps we might find, we might expect some differences between some of those who were more populist, some others were more conservatives, some others were just authoritarian dictators, but curiously enough, perhaps, um, I expected to find something, but I didn't, I didn't find it at all, thanks to corpus linguistics. Um, then in that paper, or in that first attempt, um, in this, uh, I found, uh, I published a paper entitled The Discourse of Good and Evil in 20th Century Speeches, and uh, there I could show that there was something which was pervasive in all the speeches I had analyzed, which is, in this case, metaphor analysis, which is something I like very much. So I found the doctor metaphor. It was pervasive in Hitler, in um, um, Obama, in um, um, Johnson. This doctor metaphor is quite, was well, very pervasive and also very dangerous because if you construe uh, a nation as an individual who is ill and uh, this disease is caused by perhaps cancer, perhaps by uh, an infectious disease, what the doctor is expected to do is to try to cure the, the, the patient. Interestingly enough, in, for instance, the case of Hitler, he was the doctor, the medical doctor, the country, Germany, was the patient, was very seriously ill, and the only solution was the solution to amputate a hand, a leg, an ear. And the ear, the hand or the leg, was representing, luckily enough, different minorities, as you might imagine. So that's something I found quite scary. The same pattern the same strategy in all different types of politi politicians or speeches. So that's, that was perhaps the first attempt to do a more thorough analysis from a corporate linguistic perspective. But I said that um, I like politi uh, politics and politicians. And here I must mention something that it's also very um, scary, perhaps very challenging which is the notion of post-truth. Um, uh, this is a moment of global crisis. This is really time for changing paradigms. And uh, this post-truth, um, this phenomenon is something that I'm really interested in. And uh, it also, um, in a way, is filtering my, my analysis. Now I'm working, um, because of my interest in post-truth, and political discourse, um, I'm working or I'm doing research in two different but quite closely connected areas. On the one hand, this is discourse of jihadism or extremism or radical slam, and especially paying attention to, um, um, like in this paper, 
uh, entitled I'm Proud to be a Traitor, the Emotion, Opinion, Interplay in the Hadith magazine. Um, we do, and well, mind you, when I use the term we, I do mean we, I mentioned the people I'm working with in a second. So in this case, this paper has been co-authored by my dear colleague, Miguel Angel Benitez Castro from the University of Zaragoza, and myself. So we have been working um, on the analysis of different uh, propaganda magazines produced by different uh, terror organizations like Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, um, uh, et cetera. So here we applied um, a very nice, a very nice, we think, uh, theoretical approach to this type of discourse, which is political in the sense that it is about, it's not political speeches, but it is the text written by these um, organizations, which in the end are political organizations. So um, that's something I'm doing now, we're doing now. And there's something else that we're also interested in, and which is, as, as I said, connected, which is populism. Perhaps we will have some time to discuss what populism is, uh, is later. And populism is something that it's a phenomenon, the phenomenon in this um, period of crisis. And even though you might think it's not connected with jihadism, it's got lots of similarities, well, lots of resemblances, especially as far as the language of emotion is concerned, the type of metaphors they employ, the type of strategies, persuasive strategies used by these groups. So that's why um, I'd like to show you a bit bits of this type of approach. Now, in populism is, well, uh, Professor Perez Parede mentioned before this um, quoted volume that um, uh, Miguel Angel Benitez Castro, Francesca de Cesare, and myself edited uh, some years ago. And there, there was a very nice compilation, very beautiful papers uh, that dealt with populism from different perspectives, most of them corpus based discourse studies, some others purely corpus linguistics, and some of them. Um, more political communication related. Um, populism is, well, it's something I'm really, um, I'm really a nice start because um, it combines all these features. So it is a phenomenon, well, perhaps this so-called thin ideology, according to some scholars, it is a discursive strategy also, but also a style that is beyond ideology and the some features all populisms share so the usage of emotion how polarization works in this particular context the fact that there must be one very powerful leader how e-democracy or what we understand by e-democracy has favored it um, where politics has become a show and we must remember some politicians British or American who are really show, showmen. So for, and obviously this idea of post-truth, right? Well, it's not true, but we don't say line, right? The um, populism is basically all this about. Um, social networks is, was, are perhaps the um, best way of favoring uh, populism and it's sometimes extremist um, discourse through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all these images of a world where there is a we versus or a us versus them. It's quite, it's quite um, successful and efficient. In actual fact, we represent good and uh, they represent evil. Um, this a spectacularization of politics is also connected with, and then this has to do with what I mentioned before, this oppositional discourses. So there's this opposition all the time. Sometimes it is uh, fallacious, sometimes it is true, but there's always this fight, as I said before, good versus evil. Um, connected as well with this idea of post-truth is how lying or half truth are pervasive in the special social networks. And um, 
in these cases, because there's these oppositional discourses, there are such um, this battle between anger and disgust, sometimes quite, quite to, um, I think it's quite awful to see how individuals in Twitter fights just um, being quite disgusting and uh, even unreasonable, etc. And uh, well, we may remember some uh, politicians in South America, obviously in Europe as well, who are like the Messiah, who will find a solution to your problem very easily in simple terms. So populism was something I wanted to talk about. But as I said, um, I, I wanted to show you especially how badly I have been working in the area so that you could never do it as I did it. So perhaps that's why um, um, today I'll show you some some bits or some other some say, yeah some other bits. So um, what type of research have I done so far? Um, all right. Um, yeah, that's the question. That's the question. So um, if you want to have a look at what, or if you're interested in what I've done so far, you may just uh, Google my name. We find um, Google, uh, yeah, in ResearchGate or um, in, yeah, you, you can find my name there. And uh, uh, if there's something you like and you cannot have access to it, just let me know. And um, I would just send you um, any of the text and we can discuss them because feedback is always very important. But I said before that um, I wanted to talk about what I've done, but actually um, I like to talk about what we have done so far. So what we've done so far, and this means that I believe in collaboration, collaborative work, and um, I mentioned some of the people um, um, who um, share my interest and also some time together. So um, here you have um, two political scientists from the University of Granada, Oscar Garcia Luengo and Manuel Trenzado Romero. They are political scientists. They do much work on um, political campaigns. And uh, some years ago, uh, we started working on several campaign materials, especially videos. And uh, we saw sometimes, we also saw some materials concerning the political debate and um, some political speeches. Um, they are essential in my research because it is the own approach to political communication that I started considering at the time. Um, in discourse studies, in corpus or critical corpus plate or critical discourse studies, I must mention two other colleagues, very nice friends as well, Miguel Angel Benitez Castro from the University of Zaragoza, I mentioned in the report, and um, Francisco Jose Sanchez Garcia, uh, who's also uh, an expert on rhetorics. We have done some research on particular cases, so Spanish and uh, American politics. And um, we've done it from different perspective, we'll mention later, because the two of us, the three of us, like systemic functional linguistics, we like rhetorics, pragmatics, and uh, some bits of uh, paralinguistics. So that's, that's been also essential for this research I'm gonna mention. And now we are doing something also connected with natural language processing. And here I must mention Juan Luis Castro Peña and Manuel Francisco Aparicio, who are experts on machine learning. And we're trying to identify, especially um, the bias, um, or populism traces or um, radicalization traces in the net uh, thanks to an algorithm they have um, developed. So this is we I. So although you see their I is sometimes we, sometimes it's I, but um, uh, actually it's not important because what matters is that when we have been working together, there's one good idea that becomes the best idea. So I'd like to mention that before. So um, in my research, um, there's, in my research, in our research, there's like this heterogeneous nature, which I also should, I should, I thought I should also explain because sometimes 
especially young scholars, they believe that they, they should not pay attention to different aspects. They're just looking at their single aspect. And perhaps that's um, a mistake because we can do different things from different perspectives and still be very systematic. So my, my at least my, my approach is heterogeneous because I like different as I, I, different, I, I like looking at and observing reality. And, um, and that's how you can see that in my research. So I love Ireland as uh, Professor Perez Parede mentioned before. I like gender studies and I've done some bits and I like politics. So I've been able to combine these three interests in some of the papers I'll mention today. Um, in politics in particular, these three topics are combined. So I analyzed gender discourses and populist discourses and radical discourses, which is something, as I say, which is now a very important topic um, uh, in my research. Um, I said that the core of this talk was about presentation, representation, performativity, right? So. Um, how did I do it? How have I done this research so far? I mentioned that I'm interested in pan linguistics, in rhetorics, in pragmatics, and in system and functional linguistics, which is not bad. It's just uh, sometimes it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit difficult because you have to uh, be critical of them all, and it's not so easy sometimes to to be a pirate all the time. Anyway, um, in pan linguistics. Um, I have analyzed body language, especially um, in those cases when trying to disentangle the um, cap capability of a politician to tell you a lie and to convince you of that lie. Um, I think that um, in rhetoric, especially important, the notion of topoi and fallacies, this logical argumentation, these, as these statements that look true, that look valid, they, they are they are really uh, invalid. Um, metaphor is something I've always liked. So I've also looked at uh, metaphor and in systemic functional linguistics, especially when we try to understand how we construe our inner and outer worlds, I thought that was important to look at uh, issues such as transitivity or modality or appraisal or multimodality. This, very many things that can sort of provide us with a clearer picture of the universe that politicians, of individuals, of ourselves um, um, are making, are creating. Um, but, but if we don't do it, uh, looking at, or we don't do it from a corpus assisted discourse analysis perspective, this is as if it were a little bit, um, yeah, not that solid. So this is everything um, from that perspective. And we have used uh, sometimes concordances such as Ankong or as Wesme tools. Uh, we've used Sketch Engine, British Natural Corpus. We have used SANS for sentiment analysis, UM Corpus tool for manual annotation, etc. So this is perhaps a sort of, yeah, this is like a picture of myself or ourselves that shows clearly what we've done, what we've done so far. Well, I like this picture a lot because this shows what we do when we do corpus linguistics. We try to identify patterns. This is an old fashioned word, I think, but I still like it. I still like it because I think it shows what we do when we do corpus linguistics or we do corpus based um, discourse studies. We're looking for something which is frequent, which is repeated, that uh, shows something about a particular individual style, a genre, uh, a period of time. Um, these patterns um, in social linguistics we're very familiar with, right? So sometimes if we find these three examples of text, we might say that if we look at certain patterns, we might know uh, the gender of the writer. Well, that's something we already know. 
if even though there's controversy and sometimes it's not clear whether there's always the same pattern set we know something about how some women and men use language and despite the problems well we might find something of the like we know that obviously the usage of certain lexical terms shows the age of individuals uh, we know that the nationality or the the origin of an individual can be shown through the language they use uh, and of course their style and this allow us to see who the author of the text is so we know that this the present of certain patterns show who we are and why we're different from someone or why we are similar to someone else if we think about politics obviously these patterns show our positioning too or we think that these patterns show our positioning but this is not something new i said before that this might be to some scholars this might look like an old-fashioned term and uh, these are perhaps perhaps young people might say well this was long ago that these are the real uh the people we should mention generally all the time when talking about corporate linguistics um well, roman jacobson john robert firth john sinclair of course geoffrey leach and roger fowler well they talked about patterns they talked about concordances in different ways they talk about the syntomatic and the pragmatic access some of them applied it differently and um, uh, for those who do corpus stylistics what well, they may remember roger fowler and his linguistic criticism something which in 1986 was something like new perhaps the best uh, or the first approach to to literature from a different perspective which tried to try to avoid subjectivity and uh, well they were the first one and in particular john sinclair we might say that he is the founding father of what we call today corpus linguistics so here they are and so patterns are not that old-fashioned they are really trendy they are cool um when we talk about patterns then we think about tendencies something tends to be the case tendencies which can be measured in some way measurement in mathematics in physics in chemistry is something easy to apparently to do in discourse in linguistics is not that easy so we corpus discourse analysts we linguists have to learn how to measure something to really show that this is a pattern which is a tendency which doesn't happen by by any chance and that's why we learn to use something like for instance log likelihood an effect size calculator and uh, when we compare two different corpora which may be different in size but we try to share whether the preference for one particular feature in one of these corpora is really something that is explained not by any chance but it's caused by something um this makes me think about or i was trying to explain this quickly and efficiently which is not easy so perhaps this picture shows that so a causes b or b causes a a and b cause each other and this reminds me of something that i learned some years ago causality um is not the same as correlation and uh, which is something we are not taught to see and um, one of my friends told me you know um you know that now global warming is a problem is a real problem and there are no pirates therefore if we are not pirates global warming will keep being a more problematic issue in the future and i found that in the internet and that is true that is true so some people might sometimes explain um, a pattern based upon something which is not the real cause of this pattern so that's something that in corporate linguistics we try to do when we do corpus based critical discourse analysis we try to explain the presence of a feature 
based upon something which is really the cause, not something that we think is the cause. Um, for that purpose, we've got plenty of resources. I mentioned here only the ones I've used, we have used, but there are many others that are very useful, especially depending on, on what's your, your uh, topic or your uh, main area of expertise are. So in this case, you've got there with me tools, uh, which is especially a concordance uh, sketch engine, which is a huge resource where you can have access to lots of data. Well, lots, lots is millions and millions and millions of real data and produce sketches, uh, engrams, et cetera, something I'll mention in a second. If you're interested in sentiment analysis, which is an issue nowadays in um, uh, politics, but also in, uh, in, um, in advertising, etc. well, you need to know something about how we sometimes favor something or, or pretend something like more favorable or not. And this is something that can be analyzed through stands. If you're interested in semantic analysis, there you have W matrix. And of course, all the software produced by uh, Lawrence Anthony, this ant conk, this ants everything uh, is, pre is, is useful and can help you to do very systematic, very decent, very um, 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 relevant research. Something I mentioned, or I did not really mention, actually, I said that when we do corpus-based um, discourse studies or corpus linguistics, or when we study political discourse from a corpus linguistic perspective, we avoid cherry picking, we avoid bias, research bias. Something else which is very important is replicability. If we use all these software programs, if we do research in a systematic fashion, we will be able to show how we've done it and how others can sort of try to replicate what we've done and see whether our findings are um, consistent or not, are more um, under interpreted or an example of under interpretation or over interpretation itself. Right. Um, well, you know what these terms are, but just for you to remember. So we have analyzed concordances, keywords, when you compare two different corpora, what is more outstanding in one of those. Um, and it's not just a matter of, of chance, etc. These engrams and especially sketches, collocations and semantic prosody. This is a difficult problem. Uh, semantic prosody or it's something which shows what we understand as more connected with a yeah what some people call a connotation how sometimes the taste the flavor of an expression is not something subjective it's based upon the color case of these terms so we know that green may have this negative semantic prosody because it's using concepts such as green with envy something that perhaps we might not think about in Spanish, because in Spanish, the word green, green is generally associated with only a word such as hope. Um, so this is a bit of what, um, yeah, uh, how or what I've done. So let me show you something that was, um, uh, we produced some years ago, and these three books, or this, yeah, these three publications, are um, 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 different approaches to different election campaign materials. It was Spanish elections. So we look at the 2004, 2008, and 2011 Spanish elections and look at different uh, text types. So this is, these are three of them with uh, my colleagues from the political science communication department. And um, we found interesting things. In these three, um, we did something which is purely multimodal analysis, uh, multimodal analysis in propaganda materials, uh, which is um, perhaps less um, accessible to those who want to do corporate linguistics because we need very accurate multimodal software programs. And so far, we only have uh, access to some of them. So in this case, it was a very, um, very um, uh, preliminary approach to, to those materials. But let me tell you something of what I said initially in this 
um, presentation, this perfect imperfect presentation, probably imperfect presentation. Um, lots of years ago, uh, I wrote um, a paper entitled, I want to be a prime minister. Um, and um, this is something that today I do differently. I do definitely differently. However, I like the paper. I like the uh, object of research. I like the topic, well, I like the topic, and uh, but I do it differently. So that's why I thought I should start by saying something about this paper and Bakwal, whenever you can interrupt me. So um, some years ago, uh, actually 20 years ago, um, in this region, this where I, I was born and I live, there was um, an election campaign where there were four different political leaders. They belong to very different political persuasions. And these are their pictures. Well, these were left wing, social democrat, nationalist, and the conservative leader, interestingly enough, was a woman. It was the first time that someone, a woman, uh, tried to become the prime minister in this area. So at that time, I thought, well, I was young enough to, and naive enough to think that this was, I was inventing the wheel. So in my invention of the wheel, I, I wanted to study different aspects. So the first one, I did really want to study ideology through language, how, or how ideologies construed discursively, because there were four different political persuasions. Um, there was the, the winner, was unexpected. So I thought that perhaps I could find something interesting about the language of the one who, the political leader who had won the election. So I thought, oh Jesus, I'm gonna find something which is like the language of victory. And definitely because there was one woman there, um, I thought, I think I can see something concerning the language of uh, male and female politicians. There might be something there. So I tried to do that. And I said that today I do it differently. And actually, I think I must do it differently. So perhaps I should do it the same now. I should see whether I can replicate that research now with all the software programs, all the new skills acquired, etc. Uh, because sometimes we may think that this is a failure. This paper is a failure because I do it differently. But sometimes failure. Um, allow us to learn a lot and uh, actually we may fail to do something because we don't know it perhaps because we are not good at applying it or because we simply um, didn't understand it but in my case I didn't have any idea at that time about what corpse linguistic was I hadn't, I hadn't used it so it's a failure or I do it differently because I didn't know what it was but anyway thing was that in this type of research, um, um, in this Andalusian debate, I did different things. So perhaps what junior scholars should remember is the method. So in this method, I did some of those things I did correctly. So the compilation and in transcription was really a pain in my neck because when you're transcribing so much oral text 20 years ago, no software program so it may be very difficult but anyway i'm not gonna say i was just uh, uh, amazing it was just how i wanted i did it and i did it and i did manual annotation for those who are familiar with annotation especially you and corpus too you might say okay that's good manual annotation is the thing however manual annotation is manual annotation myself my computer my documents and myself, they're just um, finding word by word what I was looking for. So I was trying to find patterns that show what the language of victory, the language of, um, of idea, different ideologies and the language of men and women were, and I found some patterns, but for sure, I should see whether this is right now with all the information I have and all the skills I've acquired after 20 years or so. But I found something interesting. Well, I'm sorry if you cannot see it, but given that you're gonna um, get the 
the recording. Uh, and of course, I can share the, the paper with yourself. So here you've got lots of colors, lots of colors. But I might tell you that there's like a tendency uh, for certain persuasions, uh, usage of certain phenomenal usage, um, certain features of disagreements, of politeness, uh, the usage of uh, um, modality, uh, pattern, etc. I found differences. Um, if we had time, and that's why I have there one, two, three, or four, I would ask you, who do you think is number one? Who do you think is number two? Who three and who four? Because, well, I'm not going to discover anything now um, because I, I don't have time and I want to show more of what I've done incorrectly or I can improve now. But truth is that I found certain patterns which were at that time, to my eye, were relevant and interesting. And in this paper, um, perhaps what I saw was that everything was unexpected. And this unexpectedness um, was, oh, yeah, was represented through hybridization. This term is used by Norman Fairclough. I like it very much because when we use a hybrid discourse, like this hybrid uh, teaching now, um, we are using something which is not expected in myself, but in other speakers, in other writers or users. So uh, let's say, for instance, that the left using the language of the right. And the right, if we like that terminology, is using the language or strategies of the left. Um, males are using the language or strategies were expected to be used by, theoretically, females and the other way around. And that's why there's this unexpectedness everywhere. Actually, the winner is the one who uses the poorer discursive strategies. So perhaps the paper was a disaster because I was not using quarter linguistics and I should do it differently nowadays. But as far as I, um, I can say now, I know that there were certain ideas that were relevant and that I should check now against um, or based upon these new, uh, new um, uh, software. I said that use manual annotation, so real manual annotation. If I had used keyword analysis, which I did, by the way, so I've done it for this presentation, I could see that it was like fireworks. So this would be like the, an amazing finding, uh, but I didn't do it for that paper. So I've done it just to check that it was not too much um, um, wrong. And uh, well, actually something good was there. A little bit later, um, again interested in this uh, election campaigns material, uh, Francisco Jose Sanchez and myself wrote a couple of papers, but I'm just gonna mention this one, which is quite nicely entitled, Why do deception and coldness win political speeches? Again, another question, so, or another interesting statement, because we were looking at uh, two politicians, uh, in this case, um, Spanish politics, those who know a little bit of Spanish politics, you may remember um, in 2011, there were two candidates, um, a social democrat and the conservative one, who um, stood for their own values and beliefs in a very interesting political debate. And there, as citizens and as scholars, we could see how they were using language for their own benefit. And there was so much, there was so much to say that we decided to, to look at that. So how did we do this paper? This paper is not, as I said before, I would not do it that way. Yeah, this paper, I would do it this way because this is uh, based upon all these, um, let's say, um, methods or knowledge that we have acquired a little bit later. So in this paper, we did different things. <coughs> Sorry. So we use some paralinguistics. Uh, we use some rhetorics, as I said before, pragmatics, and obviously corpus assisted discourse analysis. Um, we wanted to look at how these two politicians talk to each other, and that meant to look at the micro expressions. This is quite tough and uh, it took lots of time that 
um, it was quite interesting because the answer to the question, why does deception, why um, does deception win elections, um, was replied through the analysis of this microexpression um, that are quite important, are very important in psychology. Um, we use also another term, which is fallacies, to understand how they articulated their own um, um, arguments. Um, fallacies, the notion of fallacies, as Hamlin said, is quite, well, it's very interesting because it's different from making a mistake. Because make, making a mistake, we make mistakes sometimes when we are articulating our thoughts just out of um, lack of knowledge or um, sometimes unwillingly. But fallacies in political discourse are something we do intentionally and we hide the reason behind it. If I say something like, um, Pascual is black haired and clever, uh, Raquel is black haired and clever. Therefore, everybody who's black haired is clever. So this is one fallacy that we see in lots of, well, this is just one example, but this is one of the potential um, fallacies we find in political speeches. It's so difficult to disarticulate these fallacies because they look um, reasonable, they look based upon um, real data, and that's not true. So we also were, we also were interested in fallacies. Metaphor again is something that we knew it's quite frequent um, in politics because in order to construe an understanding of sometimes complex concepts of some um, um, difficult yeah notions or systems, we need metaphorical utterances. And finally, what we use in this case, Ankonk and uh, UM corpus tools. So these were the two devices that we thought were useful for analysis. In this um, paper, so for corpus collection, we had, uh, for those who are interested in how we did it, we had three different corpora. So first of all, the whole debate, and then uh, just the um, turns by the uh, left wing or the conservative or the or left um, uh, right wing politician. And uh, as for manual annotation, we use UM corpus tool. Um, this is a quite interesting uh, um, tool uh, designed by Mick O'Donnell from the University of um, uh, Autonoma uh, de Madrid. And uh, it's quite nice because it allows you to do lots of things. So uh, it allows you to do annotation, <coughs> sorry. Um, a thorough and detailed annotation, which is uh, multi-layered and uh, allows you to do to go beyond intuition. This software, this tool, is designed by systemic functional linguists. Systemic functional linguistics understands language as a system of systems. So, uh, understands language uh, is a cake, and each different layer is interconnected. So Ian Corpus tool, um, um, our rationale is this notion of language is like a cake. We can, thanks to Ian Corpus tool, we can annotate definitely each text. <coughs> Sorry, at multiple levels. We can search for instances across, across levels. I think this is quite nice. We can do we can run keyword analysis, and that's really important in corpus linguistics because uh, keyword analysis, as we'll see in a second, shows what a text a corpus is about, what its ideology, uh, and sometimes something else that some other issues that uh, we might not be aware of. It can be used statistics, which is a nice way of measuring these tendencies are not anything. Um, are caused by something, etc. So this is annotation. This is real annotation, right? Sorry. <coughs> so um, for this annotation, 
we created two different um, schemes, one for metaphor analysis and another for, for fallacy analysis. And that's how they look like, right? So if anyone is interested, we can, um, we can talk about it in the future. For the, the annotation of microexpressions, in this five minutes I have, we have no scheme, so we have to use this one. So UAM image tool, which is another, <coughs> which is another um, uh, program designed by Mekodono. What did we find? So if we look at the fallacies, the pattern, well, I'm not going to give you the data because it was not necessary, but all of them here are statistically significant. So they are clearly different depending on the ideology of the, of the politician. Um, the metaphors in this case are sort of similar, so more orientational, uh, more structural uh, uh, than ontological orientational. And as for the microexpressions, we saw that the hands were quite different um, in each of them. So um, the right and the left stood for something that was in one case pragmatic populism and emotional populism even though this is 2011 and uh, in spanish politi politics there was nothing like populism at that time that their approaches um, were quite close to what we might call today populism <coughs> well i think i've got five minutes so back well um i've got Something like 30 slides, so I can keep talking, I can stop talking, so as you fancy. Three minutes, okay, so another paper which was also, let's say, nicely done, or at least better than that the first one I mentioned, was about the representation of others, of some others in the Spanish parliament. So in this case, um, um, I analyzed the minutes of the sessions of the parliament. I used the Spanish reference corpus, the diachronic corpus of Spanish, and also sketch engine, and analyzed especially how some others were represented. You might imagine that um, there's lots of invisibility in politics, and in the case of Spanish politics, there were two invisible creatures, two invisible social actors, which were uh, gays and lesbians, especially after the um, attempt and the final success of a same-sex marriage when it was passed by the Spanish parliament. So um, this is how this, um, the Corpus Spanish uh, looks like, the synchronic one. And uh, I found lots of interesting things that I'm not going to mention, but I'd like to say something about this is the Corpus, how it looks like, etc. Uh, one example, la, 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 la. but I'd like to show you something which I think is interesting because I mentioned before annotation or I, in the theoretical background, I said something about uh, what matters in corpus linguistics, which is uh, this um, um, relying on real data and uh, causes, what causes something. So this is the key word in the Spanish parliament. So. Um, what is striking here, these are ordered. So the first one is bot. And um, it is interesting to see that. Um, well, some like studies, uh, when we look at the, this keyword and all the concordances where it is used, uh, we see that Spanish politicians were very concerned or were very interested in showing that all the findings, all the findings were based upon um, scientific um, evidence. If you look at this like problem, disorder, pathology, psychopathological, you might imagine that all the cases when these individuals are referred to are construed as problematic, as an obstacle, as something which is clearly a deviation. Um, basically, when something is a deviation, it's described as a as a disease, so a pathology, and therefore as something which is not natural, which is not normal, 
which is the deviation. So that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But the first keyword, what's evil? The first uh, keyword, as we see later, is what? So definitely, the presence of this keyword show that these individuals are, are, are portrayed as thieves, as criminals. Of course, as, as an example of immorality, as perverts, uh, as perverts, also as victims, but especially in need of protection. And and because of the presence of but, which is there, which is the first one. Um, this perhaps might make us think that adoption rights are at stake because this is this is the most frequent keyword. So what is this spot? Because we find in keyword analysis, we find in frequency list generally a uh, function word. So why is spot important here? So you might say, okay, function words are not important, but that's not true. I uh, I don't know if you ever heard uh, or if you ever heard about I guess. I've read, you've read if conditional on morality by, by um, um, Costas Gabrielatos. But if you read this, you see how important the presence of function words are in a corporate linguistic based research paper. And that was the case here. So this, the presence of but here shows what we call the discourse of contradiction, of difference, but also the discourse of pity. Yes. Oh, gay women are like you, but they are immoral. Yes, they are my neighbors, but they are deceitful. So it's quite interesting to say how people who use this but discourse show on the one hand, a spiteful image of those individuals they construe as the others, but at the same time they show like this apparent uh, tendency for, for pity. So um, I could tell you more about um, other papers, but I could stop here. Uh, Bakwal, whenever, yeah? Yes, so it's fine. So let me do something which is just to go to my last, 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 if I can, which I think is, yes, here. Here we go. If we can. But that's lost. I'm sorry about that because I wanted to do a, a perfect, imperfect presentation. So here we are. Let me see if I go finally to the last. Right. So thanks a million. That's my name. That's my email address. And if you like some, um, if you like to. Contact me, it will be just a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, maybe can you mute yourself, uh, Karma, just briefly? Okay, well, thank you so much, Ankana, for a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm, I'm really sorry we, uh, we just have 50 minutes. Um, uh, I'm sure we, we could have enjoyed this so much more extensively. So thank you so much for, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, so again, uh, please um, um, leave your questions here. Uh, I think somebody was um, interested in uh, knowing more about a software, I think is the annotation software. So maybe could you talk about that? And can I add a personal question there? I mean, annotation is is massive. So I know many PhD students come to these uh, talks. So maybe can you offer some advice to you know young sure. researchers looking at annotation? Right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, annotation um, is perhaps, and that's why I wanted to show you, or, or that's why I wanted to start by show, by telling you that my first politics paper 
was to myself was uh, nice, but at the same time was something I would not do that way again because I didn't know how to proceed. Actually, I did it more or less based upon my prior knowledge on discourse studies, but especially linguistics. So annotation is essential, uh, but not just annotation, method, um, efficiency in our methodological approach is, is a must nowadays. So we should know how to um, 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 collect our corpus, how to annotate our corpus, how to derive and um, uh, some um, uh, to produce some statistics, how to interpret those statistics. We should know whether our findings are replicable or not. We should do inter-rater reliability, etc. So annotation, uh, the annotation system I know is very efficient because it's manual in the sense that you're looking at every single feature you are interested in, but later the software itself can um, help you to, to see issues that you could not see yourself. So thanks to this software program, you will compare, you comparing different layers, different variables, and uh, see whether something is really um, what we call statistically significant. So something may be frequent. You might say I've got 10%, 20%, 11%, but you don't know what this is unless you're able to compare something to something um, to different, um, in different, um, uh, we might say different text types or different authors, different genders, and uh, it is, um, this annotation that asks you to produce real data um, and um, solid robust data. So the annotation, it's something we can talk about. So if anyone here is interested in annotating, learning to annotate, but it's getting familiar with the annotations um, software, I will, I will be really happy to talk with yourselves and show you how we do it because definitely there's something I mentioned at the beginning of this seminar or this talk of whatever this is, is cooperation. So I believe in cooperation. I believe, I, I know that knowledge is disseminated and uh, grows <laughs> really dramatically when people talk and uh, share their own experiences and knowledge. So of course, if anyone here is interested, I will be very happy to show you how we annotate. And I like the great, of course. Yeah, it would be a pleasure. Yes, of course. Yeah, we can work on that because I, I think it's, yeah, I've absolutely, it will be an honor and a pleasure to do it because I think when we learn to annotate, we see things quite differently. And uh, here, the name of, at least to myself, the name of Mick O'Donnell should be mentioned once and again. He's very generous. He shares his knowledge with anyone. And uh, that's why we now have access to this software. UN Corpus tool is very easy, is user-friendly, is very robust, and it's really um, efficient. So of course, I will, I cannot tell you how in a minute, but of course, I can share what I've learned so far, uh, whenever and in the format you fancy. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ankana. Um, yeah, that's, um, uh, I can I can really uh, say that um, Ankana has run uh, some interesting workshops and annotation, and uh, those, those were very much loved by my PhD students, so I pretty much recommend recommend such a thing. There's a couple of very interesting questions here, uh, maybe three or four of them. Um, let's start with uh, Anais. Okay, has a question here. Maybe this is just a detail, but I didn't get the example global warming and being a pirate. Could you please explain that? Well, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, it's 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 a question by uh, Anais Auge. Uh, this is maybe a small detail, 
So I didn't get the example about global warming and being a pirate. Could you, could you explain that maybe? Sorry, 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 sorry about that. Now, can you you can hear me now? Right, I'm sorry. I, I thought that the example was funny and clear. I'm sorry about that. If you if you couldn't see it, look. Um, um, generally, when we try to explain why um, there's some tendency in some cases, for instance, when we're talking about the language of women, we know that based upon um, previous literature, women generally use lots of intensifiers. Human, uh, women use very simple um, sentences. Uh, women tend to use uh, lots of um, examples of uh, epistemic markers because they lack um, security or when they're talking. That's what some scholars claim, yeah? It's not what I mean, it's not what I think, but it's that what some scholars claim, yeah? So the idea is that if you're a woman, you will have this and this and this and these features, right? That's what scholars say. So that's the cause of one particular pattern, which is present in one particular text type. So the example of the global warming is just like a, like a joke because people say that. Um, it's quite interesting to see that the evolution of um, global warming and uh, the number of pirates is the same. The more pirates, the less global warming. The, le the fewer pirates, the more global warming. So that's what happens sometimes in science. So sometimes we see the figures and we very, very simply uh, interpret that in a certain light. And we need to look at all the potential reasons, all the potential causes of that pattern. It's not just that there's more global warming because there are fewer pirates. It's just something that correlates. It's the same figures, but that's not really the cause. There's more global warming because other features, not because there are fewer pirates. So that's why it's funny. So it was just a joke. What I mean is that. In corpus linguistics, we must find the cause of some particular pattern and not just think that because you're a woman, you will be using intensifiers. Perhaps you use intensifiers because you're very passionate. Perhaps you, you use more um, epistemic markers indicating lack of security because you're a timid person, because you're shy, not because you're a woman. Perhaps you use um, more simple sentences, because you prefer simple sentences, because you think your audience will understand you better, not because you're a woman. So we must look at all the potential reasons of and causes of one pattern and explain it, not just based upon one particular aspect, but more. Is it a little bit clearer? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have another question from uh, Gillian Wei. Uh, maybe in Canada you can also find these in the in the chat box. Okay, let me see. I will I will read these anyway. And now I am analyzing the UK government announcements during the COVID pandemic in terms of both evidentiality and emotionality. All right. I want to choose a reference corpus for my self-built corpus. Can you give me any suggestions on the choice? Okay. Well, that's all right. Okay. 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 I don't know if you can hear me. I think you. I think you might hear me. All right. Well, first of all, I like the choice. It's amazing. 
I like that very much. Evidentiality is a topic, is a controversial, is a is a problematic. It's a, something I am really. I think it's challenging. So congratulations. It's very nice. It's very nice. Um, well, the um, a nice answer to your question um, would be let's talk. Perhaps instead of telling you that I'm trying to answer in like a, a provide you with the clever and quick answer. Um, to be honest, um, a reference corpus might be anything or nothing. It will depend on what you are trying to see, right? So if you have, let's say, American politics, so let's find um, the Corker corpus, for instance, let's use the Corker corpus. Uh, if you're interested in, um, um, let's say, um, American British English, but we might use the um, the um, sketch engine as a reference corpus. So I mean, the the um, ten ten corpus, and you can use it as a reference corpus. But sometimes we might find something we want really to compare our corpus to. So there's no a magical answer. Um, when we are doing corpus linguistics, there's a problem that. I think everybody here has dealt with at some point um, in the past and we have to in the future. When someone asks you what your reference corpus must be or what size, um, size doesn't matter, but size matters sometimes, right? But if you're, I'm studying just the letters and there are 70 letters, I don't have more to 70 letters. If I am analyzing interviews, and there are 90 interviews, I don't have more. But if I want to study English language, for instance, the usage of will or shall in English, I have plenty of text and the British National Corpus or uh, Coca Corpus or other corporate can sort of provide you with that information. If you are interested, for instance, in learner corpus, do use learner corpora and how will or shall are used in Lena Corpora. So that will be definitely a very important step in your research, essential in your research. And it's prior to your own knowledge of the theory or even the method. You should know how to proceed. So definitely, I'm sorry, um, I can't tell to you, this is your reference corpus. Let's talk about it if you fancy. You know my email address, but I write it again just in case. Because I, yeah, I would be, it would be nice to see what you're doing, what your ideas on evidentiality are and emotivity. I think that's very interesting. And uh, I, I think uh, we could say something about it. Yeah, we could do something, uh, at least discuss it. By the way, I'm sorry because I could see here, um, Stephen Hughes, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen, that I could not, I could not, um, uh, let me see, you, you talked about, or you said whether I could start uh, by talking about uh, emotion before post-truth. I'm sorry about that. No? Mm, no, I think uh, uh, Stephen had, had to leave, so probably uh, we have other questions. Um, right. So yeah, thank you again for your, uh, uh, for your answer, Encarna. Uh, may I say, uh, Mark Davies published a new COVID-19 corpus, and there is a paper on that, I think, in the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics, in the special issue on COVID-19. So uh, maybe yeah. you want to, to, to check out that, uh, that one. Yeah. Yeah, as, as Ankarna said, it's, it's just pretty much a methodological choice, and, and the options are unlimited. We have time for a, one more question. I suppose you we choose. can... We can uh, have a look at this very uh, interesting question. What uh, um, what is or what is the role of self-representation in this course analysis? Right. And uh, seems to me like a great question. Yeah. Well, well thanks a million. It's true. It's, it's a very nice question. Well, the notion of presentation, representation, and self-presentation or self-representation, well, are essential in this course studies in general because when we represent ourselves uh and when we present ourselves we are using different strategies sometimes we construe ourselves 
um, as actors, as passive social actors, as um, uh, beneficiary of different um, um, uh, beneficiaries. So here, uh, self-presentation is essential because um, that presentation of yourself as a, as a public persona will um, persuade the uh, audience into acting or not acting at all. So um, what does what does it mean? Well, it is essential, but not just self-presentation or representation. It's just the notion of presentation, representation, self-presentation, self-representation. How can we analyze that? Well, we use it through especially transitivity analysis and, of course, appraisal theory. Appraisal theory is a very powerful, very difficult, sometimes very, um, uh, very, um, uh, very much applied, but um, not always successfully um, um, uh, theoretical background. And uh, in order to do how we self present uh, or how we present ourselves, we need to know clearly how we present others. So it is a combination of both how we present ourselves through um, how we express our views on other social actors and the world around us and ourselves and how also express our emotions, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, which is something we can talk about in the future when looking at populism, which was what I should have been talking about today and, and emotion. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, there's other questions here. I'm encouraging people to to send these questions uh, to you, Encarna, so that uh, uh, you can probably uh, interact with those questions. So thank you, everyone that showed up today, and thank you so much for your for your input and your insight, and especially thank you so much uh, to Professor Hidalgo. So that was a fantastic talk. Uh, I'm sure that we all learned so much uh, uh, today from your uh, expertise.